Our next speaker is almost like a brother to me. Um, Ernest started out, he wanted to become a surgeon. And his second year of college, he got hit as a pedestrian by a 97-year-old driver who should never have been driving. And while he was healing, one of his doctors told him that, no, you really shouldn't be a surgeon. You would be better taking care of the person and preventing. And that meant a lot to him. As many of us, Ernest has become the continual student from Kenya University to Rutgers to Capital University, where many of us, how many people here went to Capital University? Raise your hands. Blanche, raise your hands. Dawn, Nick, a number of us went to Capital. Well, so did Ernest, and he graduated there. He also took postgraduate work at Capital Teachers College, the American Pardon? Columbia. Columbia University. At, oh, I'm sorry, I said Capital. Columbia, the American College of Integrative Medicine and Dentistry, where he completed his degree uh, for naturopathic medicine. He's board certified in integrative biological dental medicine. It's very rare that I can have a personal story to tell about how somebody has changed my life. As you can see, I'm about 30 pounds lighter than I was last year. My HB1AC was as high as 8.8. .8. If any of you know what diabetes means, that's a severe diabetic. Ernest called me one day and says, Mike, I need a referral. And we started talking and talking, meeting in the state of Florida. And I told him what was going on. He says, Michael, why don't you let me help you? And I said, well, I know you do different things, but what do you do? He says, I, and I, he used the C word. I know I didn't say it exactly right because I heard what I wanted to hear. But he says, I cure diabetes. And I go, you use the C word. He says, no, Michael, I have cured this year three people with type 1 diabetes. I said, that's impossible. He says, I know. He said, if you will do, and I have been working since 1994 or 5 to cure diabetes, and it never worked. I said, I'll do whatever you tell me to do. My HB1AC is under 6. And that's all because this man here pretty much, I believe, has saved my life. And I wanted him to share his knowledge because he told me something about diabetes that I never knew before. Diabetes is a neurological disorder. It is not a disease. Ernest? Thank you. Thank, Thank you very much. I hope you can all hear me. I can hear me. That's good. I like that. That's good. You're responsive there. Okay. I just want to acknowledge uh, uh, a few people that have helped me throughout this process. And uh, it's very important uh, that I acknowledge Rose Nadu, who happens to be my significant other. And I also want to say that what I'm going to show you is very, very descriptive. The people that have helped me to do this, most of them are medical doctors, they're allopathic medical doctors, but they have open minds and they have brilliant research um, Let's call it a brilliant research affliction because they want to question things. I always question things and I seek the truth. So I'm going to also acknowledge Dr. Yolanda Cintron because as you are dentists, how many dentists do we have? Beautiful. You're going to be very happy what you see here. Now, um, Dr. Yolanda Cintron was a surgeon that I found that was originally from the University of Medicine and Dentistry and she was very, very good in working with implants and, and, and a variety of other things. She was using both titanium and zirconium implants, and I know that there is a difference, and there is an, uh, there is an opinion that I will have. I will hold it to the side for now. I also want to acknowledge Dr. David Crisman, Dr. Carmen Mena from Madison Internal Medicine. She was the woman that was the head of Morristown Memorial Hospital, and she saw me identifying all of these problems in diabetic patients. What I was identifying in these diabetic patients was how 
And when they were eating, not only was their physical digestion disturbed, but their emotional condition was definitely distorted by how their energy exchange was really not in good shape. I also have to acknowledge Dr. Bob Pike from MIT as he is a brilliant man and he called me up one day and he said, we have found sodium nitrate in a variety of foods. Now sodium nitrate is, is, is a, uh, a devastating substance because it makes a person that's a vegetarian look like they're eating beef by the tons. What does it do? Why do farmers put sodium nitrate in foods? Because it makes the food bigger, it makes the sugar vacuoles inside of the cells of those foods larger, and it makes them sweeter, and they cost more. So they make more money. That's just one part of it. So I also have to acknowledge him, a brilliant man, he's up there in age, but Dr. Bob Pike. Then Dr. Grant Parr, who was one of the foremost surgeons uh, in the Northeast, uh, probably in the world. He was a cardiothoracic surgeon, the head of the Gagnon Center at uh, Morristown Memorial Hospital. Now, in this process, I have been able to put together a technology system, and I have also, I'm, I'm in a process of pending patent pending three, three items. One is a mechanism that will help other doctors to treat diabetes in their practice, whether you're a dentist, a medical doctor, a naturopathic medical doctor, that's gonna be part of this patent. The procedure will also be patented. We can talk about that at a later time. To go through this, um, and to go through this as fast as I can, there will be some part of me reading some of these things that I've written uh, and, and in summary, what I'm going to do here in the next hour and 20 minutes is I'm going to let you see how holistic integrative dental medical care for the treatment of type 2 diabetes is appropriate in all levels of care when a person cares about their patients. Uh, advanced medical technology for the advanced healthcare practitioners and for people that have open minds to understand that this disease is completely 100% curable. I'll say, I'll say so I don't get in trouble, it, it can be advanced and, and it can be regenerated. And the disease of diabetes is not just the red blood cell shrinking and high blood glucose uh, causing agglutination in, into the blood and oxygen deprivation and high, high blood sugar levels. It's a lot more than that. Training to be accepted by all insurance companies. I've had, I've had the, the advanced medical protocols accepted by several um, insurance companies, and I actually have talked to CMS. And CMS, I was the first integrative medical doctor that does not prescribe medication uh, to be accepted by Medicare and to have the ability to be paid by Medicare for this treatment. It's important to know that we have blood tests, we have urine saliva tests, and we have training uh, that can be given to you. And, and this training can be something that will take maybe a couple of days to maybe some weeks and to understand some flow charts and to understand the outcomes of, of, of certain responses that you get through both blood and urine and saliva. This is going to help to identify diabetes in the mouth and to stabilize basically the ground regulation systems in the human body. Uh, humoral immunity in the human body, very, very important part of how the cell stays hydrated. And if the cell doesn't stay hydrated, what happens to the minerals that are in and around the cell? They leave. And if those minerals leave, then what happens to the cell? Does it stay open and flaccid or does it respond and does some of it stays still, still semi-permeable. Well, when it's dehydrated, it releases. That sugar, that sugar comes out and goes into the blood, the blood gets thicker. So a big part of what I'm going to teach you is how that we have to maintain the mineral energy, the red blood cell function, the nervous system, uh, and, and the pancreatic uh, control and, and the pancreatic gland. 
as you see here, this is, this is the whole, whole area of how, how a business plan could help each and every one of you to enhance your practices and to do what is necessary. We can look at this at a later time, or you can speak to me in the booth, and I'll be happy to uh, be much more descriptive and understanding, make it more understanding. Now, looking at diabetes, if I'm going to practice allopathic medicine, a patient is going to come to see me, and then I'm going to look in their blood, and I'm going to see that they have high blood sugar. Their blood sugars are going to probably start off maybe 120, 130. They may have had that for several years and not even know that they've had it. I'll get to the statistics a little bit further down. I have to get through this as fast as possible. Um, many times people do not realize how fast food affects their blood glucose. So postprandial numbers sometimes are good and sometimes they're not. I've seen people that are taking their blood sugars four, five, six times a day. And I've said to them, I said, listen, please do me a favor. Take your blood sugar first thing in the morning only. That's all I want to see. And next thing you know, they say, well, wait a minute. My endocrinologist told me that I, I have to take it postprandial. I have to take it before and after. I have to take it before I go to bed. So then I say, okay, listen. You'll learn that I'm only going to need this to help you. I only need your blood sugar in the morning. So my point is now that when I tell them only to take it twice a day, what do you think happens to their blood sugars before I do anything else to them? They go down. That's a sympathetic response. I've acknowledged it in hundreds of people. They stop taking their blood sugar and they look, okay, wait a minute, all I ate was this piece of fish, a little piece of, of, of a sweet potato, and a salad. And next thing I know, ow! Not only did that hurt, but it took so long for me to get the blood out of my finger. Well, it took so long to get the blood out of the finger first because your blood is thicker at that time. But then they're frustrated because I thought I ate well and my blood sugar went up 30 points. That would be a little disturbing, wouldn't it? So these are the things that you have to try to, to, to understand and uh, I have to give this to these patients. And, and essentially, again, in allopathic medicine, the first thing that's going to happen is I'm going to see them, I'm going to say, okay, here, eat better, drink more water, get some exercise. Now, do you think they have the energy to get the exercise? No. They, don't, they have high blood sugars and low oxygen levels. They don't have any energy to, to implement the exercise or to start and to do things. So the other thing is that I say, okay, I'll see you in three months. That's all I say. It's 15 minutes. It's one unit, one insurance unit. 15 minutes, goodbye, you'll be okay. Take the 1,000 milligrams of metformin, and, and, and maybe you're going to have to take some genumet and some genuvia, and, and, and you'll be okay. They come back in three months. Their blood sugar is twice as high, and their triglycerides are off the wall, so now I give them Lipitor. Okay, after that, I'm going to give them high blood pressure medication. So I give them high blood pressure medication, and um, I see them in six months. Their HbA1c is now a 10. So they have an average blood sugar of about 185 to 190. I didn't do anything wrong. I'm following the pattern. I, I'm doing what I'm supposed to do. I'm giving them that. I didn't tell them to do anything different. So then all of a sudden they complained to me about I have lower back pain. I can't move. I'm stiff as anything. I can't move around. I don't feel too good. Okay. So... Those two drugs, what do you think they do to the blood sugar? Raise it. Did anyone else know that? All of you probably did. Okay. Um, and that just causes the problem where it, it, it's reduced energy output and a depletion of stored energy. And basically, in medical nutrition, you have to be able to give people how they, they need to know how to eat and need to know that the purpose of food is energy. That's the first purpose of food, energy. If you can't get energy out of the food, we're going to be looking at what we call biologically valuable foods. And we're going to be looking at textured foods. We're going to be looking at all of those things here today. So I know I have to go faster. I'm sorry. And basically what I'm, what I'm saying here is we have inappropriate food intake. And, 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 and these foods are the foods that you're going to see have low biological value. Now, 
The term low biological value originally started probably um, in the 60s to 70s, and one of the uh, best books on this earth by Mitchell and Reidenberger, and they were from Cornell and from Harvard. And at that time, they talked about polyol pathways, which we'll get to, how food turns to sugar alcohol. They'll talk about other things. But when we look at low biologically valuable foods, we first start with what we call either a net protein utilization or a protein efficiency ratio. And that's how the biology of the food begins. But you have to understand that the biology of food, where I come from and where I'm going to teach all of you, comes from pigments and uptake of minerals and the absorption and utilization of this food gives me this many calories and it gives you this much energy. Well, if I give you an egg as an example, how long do you think it takes for an egg to digest? Anyone want to take a guess? Hour and a half. Hour and a half maximum. If it takes an hour and a half and you take a slice of toast and a piece of, uh, uh, one egg over easy on a slice of toast, that's about 180 calories. That'll last for about 660 calories. So that's a net. You're going you're gonna to drop a whole bunch. Of, if a person just eats that for breakfast, that right there in and of itself is going to decrease blood sugar and increase the absorption and the utilization. And that's how you measure the biological value of food. Now, so in simply stated, and you'll have a definition up here, but I'm going to just jump a little bit ahead here. If I take a food that has a, a high biological value and it gives you so many calories, but it gives you an extended amount of energy over time, so the least amount of calories for the most amount of energy with the least amount of oxidation. That's what a biologically valuable food is. Now, most of the time when, when we eat foods uh, that are hard to metabolize, it causes you to become hungry. It causes you to continue to eat. That causes you to suffocate yourself. Okay, and, uh, you know, soft, dry, or dehydrated foods with high sugar content, they dehydrate you, and if they dehydrate your cells and your system, you're breaking tissue and you're oxidizing. If you're oxidizing and you're breaking down tissue, do we have the ability to regenerate and heal as well as if we didn't do that? No. So eating late, chewing fast, does anyone, anyone in here can say that they chew slow? You do. So what do you do, bite and swallow? Good, good, good. Well, well, chewing is very, very important because the physical digestion precedes chemical digestion. And you have to understand that that is very, very important. And in dentistry, uh, certainly, I'm going to have to help you guys to understand how to look at saliva differently. Um, eating old food, canned or processed foods, drinking too much while eating. What do you think drinking does when you eat? to the food. Right. Good. Right. So if you're drinking too much when you're eating, and the primary place for protein digestion, which everybody in America eats around protein, they eat meat, fish, or poultry, this is the, the mainstay of my diet, then I'm going to have like a potato and maybe one asparagus. I'll have one asparagus. I'll maybe two if I'm feeling good in a broccoli ferret, and then I'll be okay. That's not the way to live. It doesn't work. Um, carbonated drinks, coffee, tea, or alcohol. Anything that has sodium bicarbonate in it causes a motility disturbance. So if food is moving through your digestive system faster, do you metabolize better or worse? Right. And if you're metabolizing worse, are you getting any energy out of the food you're eating? Zero. Okay. Now, so if I'm going to say coffee, tea, most people don't like when I slander coffee. Oh, it gets me up in the morning. Okay, it gets you up in the morning. And uh, my knees are killing me. I can't even get out of bed. It's a hard thing for me to go through, so I'm in pain. So I say, stop the coffee. I can't tell you how many hundreds or thousands of people have said, stop drinking coffee. I say, first of all, how much coffee do you drink? And they say, well, uh, 
eight ounce to 12 ounce, you know, goblet, you know. Oh, really? I said, did you ever go to Europe and watch they have a little espresso? Espresso is two ounces. And they have that after their biggest meal of the day, and it helps them to digest their food. But here in America, oh, let me, let me go down the street here and get an IV of coffee, and I'll be okay. It's important. Now, when I, when I, I just want to bring up this textured foods, something that's soft and dry, something that's textured, and whether it's a potato, whether it's a bread cereal, a grain, do you think that makes you chew? If it's soft, do you chew it more or less? Right. Is that good or bad? <laughs> so the bite and swallow response occurs again. It's not good. It's terrible. Because, you know, it's kind of like saying, why don't I just swallow some cement? Okay? You and Jimmy Hoffa, that'll be great. Okay. Eating textured foods, salty, you know, dry foods with low biological value, eating all around animal proteins, nobody eats five to stay alive. You need ten, ten for vim and vigor, but you need five to stay alive. Okay, so, you know, you really got to... The result of a person eating like that is, yes, I'm sure in dentistry you've heard of auto-intoxication. You understand that uh, excessive organ dysfunction in the liver causing poor lipid metabolism with increased LDL cholesterol due to salt ingestion. Did anyone know that salt increases LDL cholesterol? And, if, and that's only one-third of the cholesterol quotient. So don't you think that's only 33%? Well, guess what? If you eat something salty, after a while, you're going to go after something sweet. Your palate is going to chase after it. You will eat something sweet. And anything that's salty causes your LDL cholesterol to go up to the roof. It just, and, and, and your LDL cholesterol, well, it has its form and its function. Now, the LDL cholesterol is the foundation for all cells in the human body. So I can't tell you how many times I've seen people in the ER and they've been in the ER and they had a back injury or, 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 or a mucoskeletal disturbance or, 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 or a broken arm or leg. And next thing I know, they were put on Lipitor, Zetia, Zocor, Vitorin, or something like that because their cholesterol was over, over 300 or 350. But that was from the trauma, not from their diet. That's a mistake. The LDL cholesterol is there. It's going to go high. So if anyone goes into a, you know, a trauma, their LDL cholesterol is going to go high, and then it's going to regulate. And it's not going to affect the intimal lining of blood vessels. Whereas if they're eating, it will. And, and if it's over a prolonged period of time. You can do something as simple as water and lemon. One teaspoon of lemon juice to 16 ounces of water. And it'll get everybody's LDL down, their triglycerides down, and say goodbye to the whole cholesterol problem. Provided, provided they're chewing their food, not biting and swallowing. Um, when, when a person eats all of those foods, basically there's blocked nervous response from the enteric nervous system or the gut. And the high triglycerides from excessive food turn it into sugar that bonds to fats. It results in a decrease of, in functional energy and cardiovascular risks increase. So finally, due to the inappropriate solutions in medical care with no emphasis to healing and rehabilitation through foods and lifestyle, insulin is now given because oral medication becomes ineffective due to a fatty, sluggish liver. I can't tell you how many hundreds or thousands of patients I've seen. And they say to me, I can't sleep. Yeah. I'm losing my temper. They have hyperlipidemia. They have a fatty, sluggish liver, and they want to bite my head off. And what I, what I say to them is, is uh, okay, let's, let's look at this realistically. When, when we have a person that, that is... is really not eating well, and they have a fatty, sluggish liver, 90% of the time they sleep on their right side unless they have a, a, another skeletal disturbance. They'll sleep on their right side. They wake up between the hours of 1 and 4 in the morning, and they don't get a lot of rest. And because they can't get rest, they can't rehabilitate. They can't get better. So sleep is important, very important. Um, and, and I can't tell you how many diabetics I have seen that, okay, one day they didn't get any sleep, the next day, their blood sugar is up 10 or 15 points, like it's nothing. Yeah, it's a sympathetic response. 
And so, you know, you have a lot of things that um, result in, you know, complications from just horrible management and, and, and bad behavior. Now, looking at the disease of diabetes on a daily basis, 227 people have an amputation, 117 have end-stage renal failure, and about 50 go blind. That's 394 a day. That's 183,810 people every year. Now, all of those 183,810 people, in two to three years, they're dead. That's not what we're supposed to do in integrative medicine. That's not what we're supposed to do in dental medicine. That's not what we're supposed to do in allopathic medicine. We're supposed to help a person to regenerate and heal. The patient is the most important part of the healthcare team. So all of those, all of those things uh, can be looked at. And, and what I'm, what I'm going to say here is, I'm sorry that that's really... Okay, we need a microscope and a tweezers for this. All right. Sorry about that. Uh, I, did, Mike, did you give everybody tweezers and a microscope or no? You left them on a desk. Okay. All right. Take two aspirins and don't call me in the morning. Okay. Um, well, I'm just going to go over this quickly, and I'm going to go through the things that are, are very, 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 very important. And when you eat... The process of eating needs to be cyclic. When I say cyclic, yes, we have a sleep-wake cycle, we have a circadian rhythm. I can't tell you how many people I have seen, I'm going to jump ahead again, I'm a little nuts, um, and when they stop eating by 5.30, and obviously the people that I see that are 70, 60, 70, 80 years old, they're more amenable to doing things like that. They'll, they'll respond. They'll say, okay, I'll do that. And I'll never forget this one case. I had this woman. She was from the um, uh, Notre Dame Church in Morris County, New Jersey, and she had diabetes, and she probably was about 5'4 and weighed about 175 or 80 pounds. And Father Joseph introduced me to, to this lady, and she said, okay, um, what should I do? So I said, I'd like you to eat dinner with Father Joseph at 5 o'clock every night. She did. And guess what happened to her? Bye-bye diabetes, and she lost 35 pounds in 12 weeks. For a woman that was 73 years old, that's a lot of weight to lose. And quickly, again, it's going according to rhythm. If you eat later, it puts pressure on the liver, puts pressure on the kidneys. The liver and the kidneys are trying to filter your bloodstream. All right, and, and that, that is the, the function of, of those organs. But basically what happens is if, if everything's coming in from the, from the night and your rhythm is trying to absorb the food from yesterday, what happens to your organs? They're under a lot of pressure, and that's called organ resistance. That organ resistance is very, very detrimental. So I'm going to say this. Breakfast, you should eat breakfast between 6.30 and 8.30. You should eat lunch between 11.30 and 1. You should eat dinner between 5 and 7. The earlier you eat dinner, the better off you're going to be. Now, when you eat, you should not drink more than 2 to 4 ounces of water when you eat. You drink more than that, you're diluting the digestive enzymes, and what's that doing to the stomach pH? Raising it. Raising it. It's raising the stomach pH. Okay? The stomach pH normally is going to be anywhere from 1.8 to about 2.5 when things are normal. And when pepsinogen turns to pepsin, that's what's needed. So if you're, if you're, looking, if you're looking at uh, drinking too much water, oh, I need my water, and you drink it while you're eating, that doesn't work. So you also want to realize that you don't want to be eating fruit with food. Everybody thinks I'm going to go to the Chinese restaurant and have mandarin chicken. Doesn't work. It's a problem. Um, the reason it's a problem is because a fruit is comprised of five things. Water, sugar, vitamins, minerals, and fiber. That's what fruit is. So if you mix the fruit with a protein, what does that do? What does the sugar do to the protein and fat? Well, I can tell you this. Sugar hardens fat in any condition. If I take a glass of milk, 
okay, and I add two teaspoons of sugar to the glass of milk and some unsweetened cocoa or cacao, and then I put, for argument's sake, I'm going to say omega-3 fatty acids or, or, or some flax oil, and I'm going to stir it and mix it. Then I'll have two people drink it. Then I'll take the glass, and I'll wait an hour, and then I'll take the glass, and I'll put it right by the microphone. Where's the microphone? And I'll scrape the inside of the glass, and it'll sound like I'm scraping cement. Now, what do you think would happen to a person that had a thyroid problem or a basal body temperature problem? What would happen to their blood vessels? Wouldn't be good. Okay, so getting back to the rules and getting back to drinking water and getting back to the order of food. Now, drinking water, you should drink 16 ounces of water as soon as you wake up in the morning, even before you go to the bathroom. It's the smartest thing for anybody to do because it is going to alkalize you. It is going to help you go to the bathroom, uh, and, and you're going to feel so much better. And the microscope and tweezers aren't working, I'm sorry. Um, it's, it's important to know that you're also uh, going to put your proteins first. You're going to eat your proteins first, your vegetables second, your salads last. The reason you're doing that is you want to put the heaviest substance at the bottom of your stomach first. That's going to help you in many, many ways, okay? This has been studied very, very closely. I watch it. I watch only people get better. Sometimes, sometimes most people, when they first start to do this, they need to eat lighter proteins. And when I say lighter proteins, beef is harder to digest than fish, okay? Chicken is, is, is a little better than, than, than you know, beef, but the worst thing is pork. Pork takes about 18 hours for you to digest. Beef takes about 15, lamb takes about 12, and when it comes to uh, chicken, I'm sorry to say, but you don't know what you're getting with chicken these days. Okay, The chickens are in bad, bad shape. If you can find an organic farm near you, that's good. But I'm going to say this, I have found so many chicken, so many places where they're so packed up with hormones and antibiotics. And, and, I, and I went to a farm, I'm not going to say where this farm was, but in a, in a little coop that's like this, okay? How many chickens do you think there were in that little coop? That's a good idea. That's exactly right, 20 to 25. And how do you think these chickens were fed? Do you think they put 20 little bowls in there, 25 little bowls? Oh, no. You know what happened? Here. <laughs> let me throw the grain here, and let me do something else to the grain. Let me put salt in the grain so that the chickens have hypertension, and we can give them, you know, Dialvan or something like that. No, I'm just kidding. Okay. All right. So you give the chickens, you give the, chickens the salt, and the salt beefs them up, even though that chickens them up. I'm sorry. I didn't mean to say beef them up. They chick the chickens them up. Okay? And it's, very, it's a foul statement, I know. Okay. But... You know, it's, it's something where you watch this, and then if you eat it. Now, I have to ask you this question. Hope somebody can answer this question. If you're eating something and you chew it, and it's tough, what does that mean? What? Does anyone know when you... Have you ever eaten a piece of chicken and it was like... Exactly. Well, that's, yeah, that's the, that's the first response neurologically that you should take and act on. But it means it's old. It means it's very old. Okay? I've had, I've had, uh, I can do in tests, mathematical tests in the lab, and I can look at nitrogen reactions, and I can see how old the food is. All right? And that food, I can see a person that's eating food that they think is so fresh. And I had this woman that came to see me from Mandarin, China, and she had a bilateral mastectomy, and she had cancer. It came back in the perianthium. And so I looked at this, this lady, and she calls me up, and I get all her cancer markers back to normal in about 12 days. So then she calls me up, and she's in Chinatown. And she calls me up from 69 Bayard Street. I remember this vividly. She asked me if she could eat smoked tofu and jellyfish. Oh, that's a delicacy. That jellyfish was a year old. Okay? If you eat a piece of chicken and the chicken is, is chewy, 
you don't want to eat it. It takes more energy for your body to excrete it than you're going to get out of it. Please. You know, it, I mean, it's, 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 pretty, it's pretty disgusting. Um, when you're drinking your water, I'm going to touch upon this and then I'm going to move on. The, 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 the process of drinking water is very, very important. But drinking water, not when you're eating, is the smartest thing. Okay? And you know what? If you're looking at your humoral immunity and you're looking at how the human body holds, holds water, okay, there's three spaces that comprise about 75% of your body. Your interstitial, your extracellular, and intracellular systems. That's called, that's where we look at humoral immunity. Now, when you look at that, and you drink the water, and then you say, oh, well, gee, I'm urinating like, like a racehorse, because it's not going into your cells. Do a little exercise. Even if you start off with 12 minutes, you need to drink water first thing in the morning, about 10.30 in the morning, then about a half hour to an hour before you eat, and then an hour and a half after you've eaten. No time sooner. Because, again, it will affect how things move through your system. You don't want to do that. Okay. Uh, you, can, you have a copy of, of all of this, so you can read it. Uh, and, and now I'm, I'm just going to go right into integrative medicine. And uh, basically, just within dentistry and within integrative medicine, you have to understand that we have to have allopathic doctors. We have to have... Uh, integrative medicine. We have to have the ability to, to build up and break down, but we also have to have the ability to diagnose with evidence-based information to regenerate and heal. And when we're looking at integrative medicine, it's a comprehensive paradigm. These are things that I've written, um, and there is a book that's going to come out that I've written, and um, you'll be notified when. Um, Although nutrition is a large part of disease, when evaluating the chronically ill, it is integrative medicine that measures and evaluates a variety of variables for clinical answers. In biological dental medicine, evidence-based symptoms from mercury toxicity and black meridians caused by dead tissue from the root canals can be isolated in the endothelial basement membrane layers to rebuild red blood cells to cure diabetes. This method takes what we already know about clinical nutrition and places it into a different perspective. Nutrition can never be understood as an isolated entity. It's impossible. Medical nutrition can only be comprehended when considered in the conjunction with the physiologic processes without, throughout the entire system. And, and it's very important that you know that you're going to be telling, well, what is health? Is health just free of disease or is it function? Health is being free of disease, but it's also being functioning. It, it, it's functioning to the point where health is to the conscious to unconscious determinants of balance, unity, response, and homeostasis. To be healthy is to be whole and complete. It is to realize and experience the genius of the human body without confusion. Now, I can tell you this, looking in gastroenterology, looking at integrative medicine, any time a person is fatigued, they have organ confusion, and basically, that's disorganization in their alimentary canal and in their gut. Organization is the key to your genius. Okay? When you have foods and you get energy out of the foods, that's the key to your genius. Illness is the beginning of confusion. No doubt about it. One of the, one of the, there was a book that I, that I read, um, Many years, many, many years ago, probably when I was maybe an infant, I don't know, but it, it talked about hope. And it, and it said in this hope, there is always hope, there is always hope. No matter what is wrong with you or how ill you are. In fact, even if the final healing in our lives is death, it is better to face it with hope, faith, and trust than to depart feeling hopeless and completely alone. When I heard that, the first time I heard that, I, it got me. And it should help you to help your patients. Um, and again, when we look at integrative medicine and food science and healing, uh, the sequence of care is critical to stabilize first, then treat, 
type of in injury dictates the speed of care, which is also based on patient's response. Patient's ability to get well is based on age and on stored energy for adaptation. A person that's 10 years old has a lot more energy than the person that's even 20. They heal faster. A symptom is not a sign of disease, it's a sign of regulation. Healing needs energy to restore, regenerate, and re-regulate, and back to, to put a person back to previous functional capacity. Food science begins with the elements of energy from the minerals in the soil to the seeds, to the roots, to the stems, to the leaves, to the buds and the flowers. And to understand the speed of transport from the pigments of all plants to the cells of the human body to sustain glucose via mineral transport to the cell bodies for a steady state of neurological control. What happens when you eat food that isn't good for you? You get tired, don't you? If you're tired, do you think you have open nerve pathways? This nerve pathway says, oh, wait, go to sleep. No. You get tired. It's because those minerals are, are gone. And those cells can't open and close. Physical digestion, dental care, chewing, GERD, regurgitation, catarrh, tartar, types of food, mixing without confusion. Again, organization is the key to the healing genius, and confusion is the beginning of illness. Sugar and sugar, sugar attracts sugar. Salt attracts salt. You ever see that? Anybody ever experienced that? You, ha you eat something sweet, what happens? You want more of it, right? Okay, what about something salty? Uh, water. Water, water, fire, fire. Help, help, save my child. Okay. Um, all right. So... That's, that's, that's an issue. Now, food as medicine. Do you think food can be medicine? Right. It's important to know that um, food is energy. Then what is it? What? Waste. Well, it's not waste yet. The second thing after energy are nutrients. Then the nutrients sustain the cells. Then if, 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 you, if, you can't take, if you can't take energy out of the food, there are no nutrients. It's dead. It's like eating that really good piece of chicken that you had, you know? Okay. Vegetables, are they good or bad? Well, vegetables can be good and bad. We're going to go over that. Um, pigments of foods, are they important? Yes, they are. Can anyone tell me why? Phytochemicals, yes. Does a woman want a lot of phytoestrogen? Depends. Okay. Um, well, if I get a lot of phytoestrogen, my voice gets high. Okay? Okay. Something like that. All right. Now, food science, the study of soil from the roots to the stems to the flowers, leaves, and the seeds, because it's all starting down here and it's working its way up. Then there's photosynthesis. Then there's carbon dioxide exchange. Then there's oxygen. So we're going we're gonna to go a little further here, and uh, we're going to keep going. And um, what is energy? Energy comes from the food that you're eating. How do nutrition and physical activity and illness impact energy? Well, basically, your nutrition is what is going to help you to stay alert, awake, and to give you the energy to have the physical activity and to fight the illness. And so... How does energy impact structure and function? Well, if you don't have energy to rebuild and repair tissue, you don't have any tissue. You just keep de degenerating. So these are the things that you have to look at. How does energy imbalance and reveal itself? How does an energy imbalance reveal itself? Tired, fatigue, excessive urination, poor sleep, high blood pressure, a host of things, high blood glucose, uh, all, all of these things. Um, we're going to look at high and low biological foods and how they affect the body. We're going to be seeing sheets of these things, and then we're going to look at um, the minerals and the pigments. How even how 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 can vegetables increase the blood sugar? Would you ever think that if a person had carrots and say green peas, what would that do to someone's blood sugar? Exactly. Good, good. 
Now, if I gave a person carrots and celery, what do you think that would do? Huh? Lower it? Someone said lower it. That, that's exactly right. That's exactly right. There's magnesium and there's salt, not too much, not the kind that raises LDL cholesterol, in celery. And, and, and there's potassium, and that helps. Anytime a person has high levels of salt, what mineral goes down incessantly? Potassium. Okay. Whenever a person has high levels of salt or has high LDL cholesterol, their neuromuscular activity is going to be potentially impaired, and their potassium levels are down. That's why. Can that cause an arrhythmia? Absolutely. Getting, getting strictly to the facts, if you look at heart disease, okay, heart disease, most heart disease or, or implications of heart disease that cause fatalities are from arrhythmias. They're not from blockages. You can go into the American Journal of, of, of Cardiology, New England Journal of Cardiology, Epidemiology Journals, and you can see that all day long. It's an arrhythmia. And guess what salt can do to an arrhythmia? Well, okay, I need my calcium channel blocker. Then I can have a white-coated tongue, and I look really good. Okay, and now that's, that's what happens. Um, effects of sugar on muscle and body composition. What happens when you see someone, let's say in your, in your office, uh, you see a person, and they're eating a lot of sugar, and then you do the body composition analysis on them. What would happen to their body composition with high levels of sugar? Higher fat from insulin, and lower muscle. So they have a higher, higher density of, of fat and, and lower muscle. And if you have a lower muscle, what's a muscle cell in compared to a fat cell? A fat cell is 10% water. A muscle cell is 75% water. So that's a horrible effect. Now we're going to get to, oh no. A microscope and tweezers again. All right, wait a minute. Let me see something. Um, you should have copies of this. Do you have copies of this? I'm sorry? Really? All right, well, then I'll make sure that you get bigger copies. And uh, it's important for you to see that Everything that's on the left side of this uh, chart are foods that you can eat. And everything that's on the right side are foods to avoid. And the reason that these things are that way is because the foods that are on the right side are either high in sugar, low in water, and if a food is low in water, does it need more enzyme activity? Yes, it does. It needs a better concentration gradient and it needs better temperature. Temperature affects the digestive process like you wouldn't believe. And if you're eating food, like, okay, we have warming foods in the winter, I know, and then we have cooling foods in the summer. So you're going to have to try to start eating like you're in the summertime all the time so you don't get dehydrated and, and, and distorted. But when we look at these foods, um, you're, you're, you're looking at, 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 at foods like the green leafy vegetables. You need spinach, you need, a, you, need, you need romaine lettuce, you need green leafies uh, that are very, very good and that are full of magnesium. You also do need um, some red vegetables. Uh, when it comes to orange vegetables and, 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 and carrots and things like that, and squash and zucchini, well, zucchini isn't, but zucchini is what we call a, um, uh, it's a textured food because it's soft and it acts like a sponge in your stomach. So does, so does uh, squash. Squash has is, is got that, that pigment that's, that's orange or, or yellow, and that squash is harder to digest. It's, it's, it's very difficult. But you'll see all of these things on here, and then you'll also see um, the biologically valuable foods, good or bad. Now, What's bad about things like um, fats that are processed? Fats that are processed, like hydrogenated fats or, or any, anything that you can, you know. D do you know, now if you read a label, if something says it's hydrogenated, what does fractionated mean? Huh? 
Fractionated is, is hydrogenated. It's another word for hydrogenated. It's in the Federal Register. Okay? So you need to know that. When, when you're, when you're you know, taking care of, of, of your, your, your patients and, and you're, a, you're a dentist, you have to ask them to read labels and know how to read labels. Okay? It's, everything's going to go in order of content. All right? And if it doesn't have a, a nutrition label on it, then that manufacturer isn't following the DSHA rule, Dietary Supplement Health and Education Act. And that's an important thing to have because it shows you, okay, we have high cholesterol, we have no cholesterol, we have fat, we have sugar, we have salt, we have all of the things that, that are needed. We have fiber. Um, but it's important for you to see and you look and, and there are times when if you, just so you know, on these charts, when you get them so that you can see them, in the area that, that has a red and a minus, you don't want to eat those foods. In an area that has a uh, triangle with an exclamation point and, ye and yellow, well, as you can see, hey, you can see that. Isn't that nice? Okay. So, so that, that's, that's, that's a little skeptical because there are spices that can be very good. Okay. Now, when you're practicing dentistry and you have a, a person that you just took mercury out and you, you maybe you uh, made sure that the vapor didn't go into their brain and you give them a spice that's really good at helping to take mercury out. Remember what that spice is? Right. Cilantro. Use that cilantro. It works quite well. You know what else helps the cilantro to work synergistically? Oregano. Oregano helps the lungs. It's good for you. Um, now, when you, when you look at, at this, oh, you can see that. Eggs, flaky fish, a mollusk, shellfish, specific types. Like a, uh, a person that has um, problems with mercury, you want to keep them away from albacore tuna. You want to keep them away from uh, not, or any, any of the farm-ranged flaky fishes. And you don't want to, I mean, if you go, if you go near the, like the cod, the scrod, the arctic char, um, the wild salmon, those are all good. But swordfish, you want to stay completely away from, tell your patients to stay away from swordfish. It's full of mercury, unless they want the mercury back that you just took away from them. Uh, I don't doubt it. That's right, Eric. You're absolutely right. Um, it's, it's, it's important to know that, you know, our food chain is, is, is in dire need of help. It really is. It, it's, it's enough to aggravate a, a, anybody. Um, now, when we look at things like artichoke and we look at arugula and asparagus, now, Yesterday, we were speaking about some toxicities of metals, and we were speaking about some things that, you know, are not good, and arsenic was something that we discussed yesterday. Do you remember? Now, arsenic in trace elements, the right amount of arsenic, it's just like anything else, the right amount of water, the right amount of glucose, the right amount of arsenic can actually slow the heart rate down. If you take enough omega-3 fatty acids at the same time that you eat asparagus, it can help the, with a little carnitine. You can help your ejection fraction in your, in your heart. And your ejection fraction will be better and stronger. And <laughs> cheers. And, and that's, that's, a, that's a good thing to know. Now, artichokes. What are artichokes good for? And onions. But onions are good for one, one organ, your lungs. Not Vidalia onions, though. When we're talking about diabetes, Vidalia onions raise blood sugar. Now, when we look at um, artichoke, artichoke is really good for the liver. It cleanses the liver, and it's good for you to eat artichoke. Okay. Um, the reason that yellow is by the cucumber is because on many times if I have patients that have irritable bowel syndrome or if you have patients that have lots of cavitations and, and, and you know, missing teeth and, and you have to put, a, put something in their mouth, uh, and you're going you're gonna to put a... Uh, a denture, and the denture is going to be in there, and, 
And then the other thing that I've been finding is on many occasions, a lot of patients don't take their dentures out enough and clean them. Do you find that? What do you tell them? What do you say to them? Take them out and clean them. Do they do it? Do you know if they come in? Sometimes they do, sometimes they don't. You give them a pop quiz? Wow. Yeah. That's, that's great. That's great. You see, talking to the patient is very, very important, but talking with them, not at them, is the key. That's how they get better. Okay, so you have all of these copies. I'm going to have to get to... Uh, um, I'm just going to get to diabetic prevention, then I'm going to go through physical digestion, then I'm going to let you see a case of a woman that for, for 28 years had diabetes. And with Dr. Sintron, um, we had to, she, she took out several of her teeth, a lot of mercury, uh, and she did have some abscesses. Those abscesses we had to control with antibiotics, but you'll see all that. We'll get to that. Um, not eating late at night after 7 o'clock. Drinking enough water at the right times, not drinking too much with food, more than four ounces. Keeping the mouth clean. Now, here's a trick question. What's better, round floss or flat floss? Uh, well, that's okay, that's a good, that, that's acceptable. But what's better, round or, or, or flat? Why is flat better? More surface area, you got it. I love it. That's exactly right. You guys, now, does, do, do any of you ever say to your patients, I want to give you hydroxyapatite and tell them why? Do you notice dentin of their, you do? Do you notice the dentin of their teeth sometimes changes and you don't? Would you? Okay. All right. Um, brushing after meals and before bed again. I can't tell you how many times I see people, they come in, they give me a saliva sample in the morning, and I find chunks of food in their saliva. They don't brush their teeth before they go to bed. I mean, you know, that's, that's like, ugh, you know, I mean. So <clears throat> what, 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 what I'm going to try to do and, and what you're going to be able to do if you want to, if you want to you treat this disease, because it starts right in the mouth, you can you can be taught to do it. COQ10, ubiquinone, 200 to 600 milligrams a day, and I have found on numerous occasions that that basically stops receding gums and stops the gums from bleeding. Does anyone else concur? I see a, hello, that's nice, okay. Anyone else? Yes, okay, okay. Uh, ubiquinone is the source of, of, of COQ10 that you want because it's, the strongest, and, and it's in a gel form, and it's the most easily uh, absorbed, okay? And um, there are great companies that make that. I can, I can tell you who they are, but I'm not here to, to give nutraceuticals uh, or buff any one company. I'm not going to do that. Um, when we looked at microcrystalline hydroxyapatite, the tooth structures, the dentin and the enamel are metabolically more stable than, uh, than bones. And the protein matrix in the enamel is keratin and dentin is collagen. So if it's collagen, what's the other substance that we're going to be having to say you should be taking this to? Vitamin C. Okay? We're the only species that doesn't produce vitamin C. We need to have a lot of vitamin C. And vitamin D, I mean, there's been a lot of things that we're, we're looking at, vitamin D, and, and all of your patients are going to benefit from vitamin D. And I, there are times when I have to give anywhere from 20 to, to 50,000 units of vitamin D to a lot of patients. I was in a, uh, a care facility in New Jersey, and I had this man that could, couldn't walk. And I looked at his medical records. He, he, he um, asked me to do this, and I had to sign all the waivers, and I went in. And he was using, they were using ergocalciferol, synthetic vitamin D. I took him off the ergocalciferol. The next day, the man was walking. That's how fast the uptake of cholecalciferol was in comparison to vitamin D2. D2 
D3 is better than D2. Nature paths in the, in the, uh, office, in, in the, in the audience are going to like to hear that, right? Don't you like uh, D, D3 better than D2? Good. Okay. Now, cinnamon and alpha lipoic acid. Um, <clears throat> again, cinnamon is great for circulation. Cinnamon is good for blood sugar. Cinnamon um, is, is really good for, for the lungs and for breathing. And alpha lipoic acid with cinnamon is excellent as an antioxidant, and it helps to protect the pancreas. It also does help out the liver a little bit, and that's, that's, in, that's important. Okay. Yes? That's, that's right on, and uh, I can't tell you how many times I find things in, in people's urine and saliva that show me that they ate something that was false or something that was old, uh, and it, 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 he, he's right on. Um, okay. All right, then uh, let me see something here. Okay. All right, I'm going to go right to this. Um, when we're looking at without eating late and, re and, regurg and having regurgitation, bicarbonates and phosphates, they buffer chemicals that enter the mouth and keep the saliva slightly acidic. And with a pH of 6.35 to 6.85 for this study, the salivary pH range ideally is between 6.4 and 6.6. I'll show you here on the next slide that you'll see that when a person eats late, when a person eats fast, they have a lot of regurgitation. They can even have bile in their saliva. Bile is the primary etiology of esophageal cancer. Salivation is entirely under nervous control. You can tell what time a person has eaten from pH measurement. Dehydration causes the salivary and the buccal glands to cease secreting saliva to conserve water. Saliva can indicate, believe it or not, I can see if a person's been yelling, if they've had stress, I can see if someone got them angry, all in their saliva. Um, and from the dry mouth caused by sugar fluctuations, dry bubbly white saliva is also identified um, uh, during fear or anxiety when sy sympathetic stimulation dominates. If the tongue is white, calcium reflux is seen in the saliva, and the salivary color and odor can indicate tartar, Qatar, liver function, speed of chewing, time, total amount of food, carbohydrate digestion, glucose, and insulin resistivity. So bile refluxate is identified by color. And yes, bile normally is black. And, and, and you can see that. I've seen women in hospitals, men in hospitals with black tongues. And uh, one of the first things that I give to them are enzymes um, and some of them were, were heart patients, and the other thing after that is a lot of magnesium. Um, when we look at a refluxate, you know, there, there is here, um, you're going to see, if you can see, here is a man um, that he, he had, he had uh, actually, they had slight calcium refluxate there, um, and their pH was... Uh, 6.37, um, and they had little or no regurgitation, and their blood sugars were before this time in the 130s to 40s, and in this particular instance, they were 113. Now, the person next to that, where it says DA, district attorney, that's not even not district attorney, don't worry, his pH was 7.32, and if you can see in this um, picture, it's a little green. That green is a sign of bile, okay? 
that person had a blood sugar prior to this one, about 150, and they were starting to get, get things back together, and their blood sugar here was 128.28. Two weeks from that time, in the lower portion right here, that person really started to change. 78 years old, okay? And that person's uh, pH was 6.9. And basically their blood sugar was 107. That's a 21 point difference in less than 10, in 14 days. Actually 714, 724. Okay. All right. So yeah, two weeks. And, um, <clears throat> those are, those are the things that, you, that you're seeing there. And you're seeing two of the same pictures here at a different angle. And that's not that look delicious. Oh God. Oh, that looks so good. Yeah. Okay. All right. So you're going to see that there's less refluxate and better digestion. As a dentist, you can see this very easily. Okay. And, and you, can, you can also see, you know, if you do, if you do this and you, and you do a bone uh, densitometry test and you look at these things over time, you'll be able to even tell them, listen, you need to do better. Your gums are going to be better. Um, you know, your mandible and the maxillary are going to be better. And you're going to see that that person is chewing better. Um, <clears throat> here again is another picture of, of a slightly high pH uh, and, and their blood sugar at this time, this was, they, they, they were eating late. This was a lady that uh, had an A1C of 7.1 with an average blood sugar of 155. She was 61 years old when she first came to me and she would, she's from the south, she ate a lot of pork. She ate a lot of milk and dairy and stuff like that. And her blood sugars were that high. Here she is with a 97 and almost a clear saliva. And that's because she was drinking better. She was exercising more. She wasn't eating late at night. <clears throat> now here we're going to go to, here's a case. And I'm going to go try to get through this in 20 minutes as fast as I can. Here's a 64-year-old female. She's uh, 28 years on uh, a type 2 on oral medication, then the last eight years on 70 to 100 units of insulin and only long-acting insulin. Now, she had seven mercury amalgams, five to six root canals, and her family history, uh, was, well, she weighed close to 200 pounds. Three of her five siblings have diabetes, and three grandparents had diabetes. Since January 2014, after root canals removed and mercury removal, three days after the procedure, complete blood sugar control. Her blood sugar was, uh, she was stuck on six units of insulin, and there, there, there she is with a pH of 6.65. Right. There's a great correlation between blood sugar, urine sugar, and saliva pH. It's straight across the board. You can't trick it. Now, this, this woman, uh, she had an abscess, and uh, that caused an increase in her blood sugar. You know that would do that, right? You think an abscess would cause an increase in blood sugar? Right? Would you give antibiotics? Yeah. Yeah, and you'll, and you'll do it. And then after, after you give them the antibiotics, you're just going to give them some acidophilus, multi-billion cells with, with, uh, with bifidus to cover the large intestine. And uh, you're going to have to give them magnesium, and you're going to have to give them some vitamin D and a lot of vitamin C. Now, this woman, she had Bell's palsy, uh, and she had paralysis, uh, some, some facial paralysis, uh, but she had really, really bad mercury toxicity. And Dr. Cintron uh, did a great job with this patient, uh, and... Um, she also had braces as a child, and, and she's, she's doing much, much better now. And now, if you, if you look at the meridians um, in any person, the meridians, uh, the, the problem with this woman is that she had really, we'll get to that, she had really, really bad teeth, and uh, she still didn't eat too well. But tooth number three, tooth number two, Tooth number 28 and 29 were bad, and then we had to take out, uh, I didn't take them out, I'm not a surgeon. And, and so those some of those teeth were taken out, and I'm going to show you some x-rays now. 
does anyone find that, or ha, that have you ever had a patient that has had really bad one, two, and three bad teeth? One, two, three. Okay. And uh, did you notice, or did they tell you that they were having some glucose problems? Yes. Okay. I'm sorry. Right. Okay. All right. Take a look at that, and um, you can see an abscess up there. But uh, you can you can see here that uh, you know this 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 woman had had lots of things that were going on, and here she is before, and uh, you know you can see can you see that? Huh? You can. Okay. All right. Um, so I mean, she had a lot of problems there. Two, three, and five. You know, root canal. Uh, we had all all of these these issues, and then you're going to see root resorption in, in a lot of these these situations, especially in, in the frontal area, uh, the central incisor, the lateral incisor. I mean, you can you can see lots of different things here, and um, the great thing is here that we're seeing how how in tooth number two here that this definitely is affecting the pancreas, and on many occasions you're going to see that there's going to be stomach issues. Now, even if a patient's on metformin, metformin causes stomach problems most of the time, not all the time. If I find a person on the metformin, I give them a a pancreatic group of enzymes, I give them amylase, protease, lipase, cellulase, hemicellulase, uh, and I give them magnesium, and I give them betaine hydrochloride. And even though there might be some betaine hydrochloride in some of the digestive enzymes that you use, you'll find that additional betaine hydrochloride helps. And, and, and it's really important to know that when these meridians are, dis- are disturbed, that that stomach is secondary. But that's what they say, but I say it's primary. Any thoughts or questions so far? Okay. All right, and here we have um, tooth number three, which was taken out, and we're going to see the end product of this. And again, tooth number three affects the pancreas and the stomach. Uh, and uh, you ever get a gut feeling about something? You know, gut feeling, stomach's bothering you. You got gut feeling. <laughs> okay. All right, so. Yes. Why? Because the 6-4 and the 6-6 in both locations, both in the urine and in the saliva, help the whole body to have better fluctuation and deal with it. When, when, you, when I say 6-4 to 6-6, um, the body is hydrated. You have to understand that the alimentary canal is all acidic. It's really out of your body. Okay. So when it comes to the mouth, you'll notice that between the 6-4 and 6-6, they're going to have better, their teeth are going to be in better shape, their gums are going to be in better shape, and, and it's, it's what I've seen, it's what I've, this, this is not an overnight study, and um, you'll also see that if there's a time when a person is eating too fast, that regurgitation is going to raise that pH, uh, and, you know, those are those are detrimental. It's going to raise it. Yeah. First of all, the pH of bile is between seven six and eight six. Yes, Jim. Yeah. No. Not when the gums are, are feeding blood to the, to the tooth. It's a, it's a cardiovascular system. When the gums are feeding, are, getting, are, getting, are feeding the tooth, then the tooth can, can be fine at that, at that six point. I mean, I, I have seen the fluctuation sometimes up to 6.8. And, and I can tell you, you're going to, if you, if you can, if you see someone that has, has um, pH in the 7.2, 7.3, and they floss their teeth with thin floss, they'll bleed. 
They'll have COQ10 deficiencies. They'll have another, a, a, a variety of other problems. But when that level is in there between 6.4 and 6.6, it's, it, it's safer. It, it's much, much safer. You're going to give them some, you know, and, and I can say this, the type of, of calcium that you should use is calcium ascorbate, ester C. And then you should always use bioflavonoids, and you should always sometimes use grapeseed or pycnogenol. That's going to help. Okay. So I'm just going to, I'm going to go, go past this, because this woman did have some gallbladder issues, uh, and her gallbladder was taken out. Uh, tooth number 29 is on the gallbladder meridian, uh, and that helped. That tooth was, was taken out. Um, and, and here we have um, tooth number 30, and that was a, a, a slight problem, and, and that was... Uh, let's see, what do we have here? Yeah, there's some definite root resorption there too, but you, you, you're looking at so many things here, and, and, and essentially I want to get to the end of this, and there it is after. Okay, so the teeth had to be taken out. She's having some uh, post, the posts are in, and on November 8th she'll have all teeth in all spaces in her mouth. Um, and uh, her blood sugar right now is averaging between 105 and, 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 and 115 without any medication or insulin. Um, she obviously, you know, had to, had to have uh, typical something that uh, you're, you're familiar with and uh, <clears throat> take some bone and, and take some blood and, and harden her bones. Her bone density was good, though. And um, as you can see there, <clears throat> just as it says on the bottom, I like that word hope there's hope and we're going to get we're going to get her better um, <clears throat> there's the process and there's our famous uh, zirconium and titanium implants and here is a picture of the beginning of that and how well she had absolutely no fibrin disturbances she had no excessive bleeding she was doing very very well that was her first implant and uh, she's, she's really, really doing much, much better. And uh, again, I know I'm getting close to... I know, it doesn't look good to you, but, but it, it's before and after. It was a horrible, horrible case. And, and, and it's going to get better, a lot better. Okay. There is one of the, the posts put in. Um, and... Uh, that's that, that, again. Before and after are, 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 have been quite quite improve, improved. Now here here is a here is a, <clears throat> something that we've seen here, which is as you can see, this isn't doesn't look good at all, right? Okay, okay, should I put Halloween up there too or something? Okay, because that really doesn't look good. And, uh, you know, you'll, you'll, see, you'll see that there is root resorption and bone softening and, you know, all kinds of things there. And that person, you can see, that's, that's, that's a diabetic. That's a person that if, they're not, if they haven't been diagnosed with diabetes, that's one of the foremost areas that you can see it. And it can be seen... You know, in your office <laughs> every day, um, and and I have to say, there's there's another one with the same the same issues, um, and this was compliments of Michael Margolis, and uh, he he knows what to do, he's got a steady hand, and uh, now I'm going to uh, show you some of the things that he's done, and 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 how. He has really, really gone, gotten a lot better, and his, his saliva pH, which had some ketoacidosis, had some signs of it in there, is now free of that. Uh, and his pH is, is about 6.6 .6 to 6.7, uh, and he has less calcium in it, 
and uh, he, he's, he's, he's a walking example. He, he's been disciplined and diligent, and uh, his blood sugars are, are normal. Uh, they're going to stay there, and his A1C is going to get a lot better. And I have to tell you this. One of the most important things to know about this disease of diabetes is, as he said before, and as I've said, and I'm going to say to you, it is a neurological problem. The red blood cells shrink. The oxygen levels go down. The sugar suffocates the cells. It's this, it, you can feel it when a person is beginning to, to eat their food and they can't break down their food and have good physical digestion and good chemical digestion, then they have major problems. One of the most important things which I was going to show, which you're going to have to look at on your own, because, again, you're going to need a microscope and tweezers, um, but we have found such correlations between urine sugar, bilirubin, urea, nitrogen in the blood, and, 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 and albumin, and, and salt, and salt, and nitrogen levels. Now, those things are coming from eating foods that you can't digest. So that chicken is going to cause that nitrogen to go up that's coming in. And then because you can't digest and break, and, and break down any of that, what happens is the body just starts to get fatter and fatter and, and, and the muscle goes down lower and lower. And so um, you, can, you can see these at a closer look. And if anybody has any questions about these things, you can certainly come to the booth. I'll be happy to answer those questions. Um, it's a lot of information, and basically dental care can stop diabetes cold all day long. Don't ever think for a minute that you're not trained to do it. You are. I'm just going to say this. Listening to the messages your body sends you, numbness from the alimentary canal to the entire hypothalamus of the brain result, red blood cell shrinkage, suffocation of the cells, dehydration of nerves and muscles. What are the symptoms? Signs of regulation, a message of change needed, not a sign of disease. Common symptoms, dry mouth, blurred vision, cold hands, shaking, pain, hunger versus thirst, sleep problems, and gum disease. Symptoms of fluctuating blood glucose and its effects on cancer. Whole nother story. But, oh boy, okay. I just want to say this in final. Um, it's important to know that, yes, it does begin in the mouth. And, and, and when you're looking at the symptoms of this disease, it's a detrimental disease. It's a horrible disease. And, and it causes, there are so many comorbidities of this disease. And you can stop it. You can stop it all in the mouth. And uh, remember that. Too much of anything is no good, and, and if we're looking at all food, all food turns to alcohol. Excess alcohol causes blood cells to stick together and impair circulation, and it prompts further risk, and diabetics have cardiovascular accidents and strokes. And remember that insulin is a salt, and if you take too much salt in, your LDL cholesterol is going to go through the roof. And basically what you're going to need to do is, is, is do some water and lemon, that the, all of those things are on the maintenance food guidelines that you need to have bigger copies of. So increase the water and lemon, and you could also put in some compre or juice or celery with lemon, and uh, I will uh, bid you all a healthy and happy rest of your day. Thank you. Ernest, thank you very much. Uh, those two slides that uh, I gave them on those panos, uh, I was the first person to tell those patients that they had diabetes. And they argued with me. And they had been going to their physicians for years for their checkups and were never checked for diabetes. On behalf of the IVDM, I have the pleasure, distinct pleasure, of giving you a token of our appreciation for the time as a speaker, one of our feature speakers for the 2014 seminar or convention this year. Thank you, Ernest. Thank you. Thank you very, very much. Very Thank difficult. you so much. Thank very you. Very difficult topic. Very nicely done. Thank you.